Will the guests please rise for the national anthem, a flyby, and an invocation? The national anthem will be sung by Mr. Jim Boyston. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that her flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. If you look to the right, you will see a flyby. The formation is composed of two F-35s. It's being led by an F-18 Super Hornet, and in the slot will be an E-18G Growler. Captain Williams will now offer the invocation. Let us pray. Eternal Father, we have assembled this morning and seek your blessings as we observe and participate in one of the most honored and revered of our naval traditions, the change of command ceremony. You have ordained that all rites of passage conclude one stage and begin another. And today, as Vice Admiral Miller concludes his time as Commander of Naval Air Forces, may he depart from here with the assurance that his leadership as Air Boss has had far-reaching impact upon the staff and families, sailors, Marines, and civilian staff across the Naval Aviation Enterprise. We ask that you bless him, Ellen, and the family as they enter this new chapter in their adventure together. In just a few minutes, Vice Admiral Weitzel will take up the mantle of leadership as commander of CNAF. As he does so, we pray that you would grant him strength and surround him with sound, wise counsel as he guides Naval Aviation in the days and weeks ahead. Bless him, Melody, and their family as they transition into this new role together. And we ask all of this in your holy name. Amen. Vice Admiral DeWolf H. Miller III. <laughs> welcome, and welcome to this ceremony held on board one of our Navy's capital warships, the USS Theodore Roosevelt, CVN. 71, one of 11 commissioned nuclear-powered aircraft carriers. It was important for me to have this ceremony on an aircraft carrier as it represents the nine deployments I've made over almost 40-year career. And the intervening years were all about supporting and advocating for carriers, the capabilities of the carrier and its air wing, as well as the men and women and families of those who serve aboard aircraft carriers and across naval aviation. Aircraft carriers and their embarked air wings bring unmatched contributions of lethality, battle space awareness, and mobility to any maritime theater. Carrier strike groups built around large deck nuclear powered aircraft carriers and their air wings enhance distributed maritime operations, enable fleet design, and provide the lethal, agile, resilient, and rapidly adaptable maritime force required by the National Defense Strategy. I'd like to thank the commanding officer, Car Captain Eric Papianduzzi, the executive officer, Captain Dan Keeler, and the ship's air boss, Commander Steve Vitrella, for them allowing us to use their ship and flight deck for this purpose. The ship looks great, and we're honored to be aboard. I'd also like to welcome those watching this ceremony via streaming media from around the world, including our friends and allies from the Royal Navy joining us from the UK today. We are thankful that you've taken a pause in your busy schedules to join us. 
COVID has certainly thrown us a curveball, but the Navy's pretty good at hitting off-speed pitches. I've witnessed this throughout my career. After 9-11, when from destruction we became a stronger nation, and again, as we navigated the challenges of sequestration and found innovative ways to excel. Things aren't always easy, but we adapt and overcome. We always have and always will. In the face of, of adversity is when we strap in and get ready for the fight. So thank you for joining us today. I'd also like to thank Commander Tom Arnold, the Air Pack Change of Command Coordinator, along with Mrs. Denise Haynes and Lieutenant Grace Carlson, the Air Pack Protocol Team, for organizing today's event and sending out all the programs and virtual invitations, as well as Mr. Jim Boyston, who you just heard with his beautiful rendition of our national anthem. Please, a round of applause for all of them. So we're real fortunate to have Admiral Chris Aquilino with us today as our guest speaker. Equally fortunate to have Laura and Lisa with us, so thanks for being here. As I'm sure you'll soon find out, Admiral Aquilino and I have known each other for many years. We met in 1980. His plebe year at the Naval Academy, and when we were in the same company, and no kid in our rooms literally were directly across from each other. It was clear even then he was a leader. Confidence was not an issue with Midshipman Aquilino, and others naturally and willingly followed his lead. You know, the bad thing about masks, you can't tell if people are smiling, if they're getting it at all. Okay, there we go. <laughs> the feedback is just missing. Just saying. But our professional paths have crisscrossed numerous times over the years, and now he leads as the commander of the Pacific Fleet. He follows in the footsteps of Nimitz and Spruance. And like at the Naval Academy, others naturally and willingly follow his lead, including me. A true honor to welcome to the podium my boss, my friend, and the commander of the Pacific Fleet, Admiral Chris Lung Aquilino. Air Boss, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, you probably are a little worried about what I might have to say. Well, you shouldn't be. Uh, I appreciate the kind introduction, and I am so honored to be here. Uh, I'm honored that you and Ellen, Kenny and Melody, asked Laura and I to be a part of this tremendous day. Uh, we're so honored to be here. Uh, I need to recognize the entire Miller family that's in the front row on the right, as I see it, and especially Ryan, Sarah, and Emily. Uh, I'm really happy that you're able to be here today in this COVID times to share this really important day with your mom and dad. To the Weitzel family, Melody, Hannah, and Jeb, also great to have the Weitzels all in one place on this tremendous afternoon. And being on board TR makes it even more special. Good morning to everyone who's here and everyone who's watching. Flag officers, family, friends, colleagues. Again, it's good to be here on TR, right? The heart of the fleet that so many of us yearn to come back to at some point. And if anybody had heard the Air Boss, Admiral Weitzel or I say we trade places with you tomorrow to go on deployment. Uh, that is said in true fact. I'd change places with you today to go on cruise and fly off this wonderful, mighty warship. All of us would. I am especially happy to be able to celebrate this event with two of my closest friends in the Navy, and I call them our Navy family. Now, when I say Navy family, everyone knows a little bit about what that means, but I'm going to give you a little bit of context on why I use those terms. As the Air Boss stated, the very first leader that I met as I began my Navy journey was Admiral Miller. And he is being way kind in his comments because many of the things I've learned through my career were through the mentorship of Admiral Miller. The first car I ever purchased was from Admiral Miller. <laughs> There's a whole backstory, we won't tell it today, but I'll give you that offline. 
When I was selected to be the aide to the Vice Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Pilling, I'm pretty convinced that there was some pretty heavy-handed push from Admiral Miller. When I took my first joint tour of duty as legislative assistant to the Secretary of Defense, that was because of Admiral Miller. When I was relieved as the Bush Strike Group commander from the guy who took him on cruise and delivered ordinance in the face of ISIS, that was Admiral Miller. So for those slow learners, the theme is I wouldn't be here today without Admiral Miller. And that goes across the board. His mentorship across the entire U.S. Naval, Navy and Naval aviators is in his DNA. And he's been taking care of people for over four decades. So if that's not enough, when President Bush 41 passed, and the Navy was tasked to support that event, guess who the Bush family called? Admiral Miller. Now, that resume you can't find anywhere. Uh, our paths have been intertwined for virtually all of our career. But as a part of my first day in the Navy, again, I am honored to be here to be a part of your last day. Thank you for everything you and Ellen have personally done for our Navy and our nation and all of naval aviation. Now, normally to change a command, the guy or girl who gets to speak usually knows the outgoing guy and not so much with the incoming guy. Well, when I talked about my Navy family, that's a little bit different here today. Kenny and I go back for a long time, along with Melody, Jeb, and Hannah. We were roommates in our first operational tour and lived in the junk room for two deployments together. So in my first six years in the Navy, I spent more time with Kenny than I did with Laura. Our kids have grown up together, and though not blood related, they are like brothers and sisters. We've, left, uh, we've also overlapped many times in our career. And for those who didn't know, he just left Hawaii as my deputy commander. Quitter. <laughs> so what does that turn into? Today is a day of celebration. Uh, it's certainly a celebration for the Miller family, the Weitzel family, but also the Aquilino family. We'll celebrate today bullets over four decades of service to this great nation and our great Navy. Four decades. All right, that should not be taken lightly. We'll also celebrate the arrival of the new Air Boss. And what's really great is I'm also celebrating because for me, the tremendous leadership that exists today in, the, in Bullet, the Air Boss, will transition to Admiral Weitzel and that just means less work for me, frankly. The great leadership here at AirPAC continues, and I'm proud to be uh, a beneficiary of that leadership. Okay, Kenny, congratulations on your promotion. Uh, for those who are back here, we just promoted Kenny to Vice Admiral, uh, and it was duly deserved, and what a great chance for me to participate. Mel, thank you for your continued support to our families. Uh, as well. And Kenny, for your reward, more responsibility as you assume command of the world's most lethal aircraft carrier and naval aviation force in the world. The challenges of achieving and sustaining readiness in our carriers and our naval air forces is a relentless task. I'm confident you're ready to pick up right where Bullet left off. So for Admiral Weitzel, the right guy at the right time in the right job to lead naval aviation into the future. Congratulations. OK. Let's talk about the Air Boss and Ellen for a little bit. If I were to count the numerous accomplishments of Bullet and Ellen over 
four decades, we'd be here for about a month. That's not going to happen today. I will attempt to summarize and certainly not do honor to everything you have done in 40 years. But those amazing accomplishments are noteworthy, and I'm going to hit on a few of them. <clears throat> Ellen, you've been a true foundation of support, not only for Bullet, but for your family and to the entire Navy as a whole. For those of us, of, for those of us who have known you for so long, uh, it seems routine, but all of your efforts have been above and beyond. Those efforts in support of our service members, their families, has been without peer. You've raised awareness of the challenges that naval aviation faces across the board. You've done it with a smile. You've done it in a manner that is so genuine it is difficult to comprehend how you give of yourself so often and so much. <clears throat> and we honor you today as well for all you've done for our nation. On behalf of our Pacific Fleet sailors, their families, I'd like to thank you for all that work. For the aviation community and for your tremendous service to our Navy, we thank you. Now, she had her mask on, but I got a little bit of feedback. I thought that was okay. And there's no crying in baseball. <laughs> now, to the air boss. 40 years of service delivering unmatched naval combat power to the combatant commanders worldwide. <clears throat> no easy feat. <clears throat> so again, without wasting a month of your time, let me narrow this down a little bit. The Air Boss has improved every aspect of naval aviation in the past three years in excess of anywhere bar none across our Navy. When we talk about man, train, and equip the fleet, his responsibility, every single aspect of naval aviation has been improved at an exponential level in just three years. Let me share just a few. Until two years ago, and for the past 12 plus years, naval aviation has been able to produce 240 Super Hornets consistently in that time. 240 every day. Today, and for the past year, Naval Aviation has delivered over 340 Super Hornets every day for our Navy to fly. Now, those numbers may not sound like much, but the effort it took to adjust, change, tweak all, every one of our processes, every one of our mindsets, and a culture change in the United States Navy's naval aviation team is Herculean. His efforts allow us to support great power competition against a couple of key adversaries that we would not have been able to be done if he didn't take it on. Training. This force trains and is ready to execute the high end of naval combat warfare every day because of his leadership. He built the leader development strategy, a first of its kind, and ensures our warriors of today have the character and competence needed to execute tomorrow's fight. Manning. 
He has completely changed our culture on how we provide the right people with the right expertise at the right time in our squadrons through his work under the Amex program. And at the same time, saving the Navy millions, hundreds of millions, while doing it. Okay, those three bullets alone, that's a pretty good resume. And it has been drastic change in our force, when most needed, for the right reasons. The future Navy, not just satisfied with today's Navy, you saw it fly by today between Super Hornets, Growlers, and F-35s. He has set up for success what the future looks like for naval aviation. And with that, he had time to spend time, you know, time with Ellen. I don't know where, uh, but every aspect of naval aviation has been improved. Bullet, you've instilled battle-mindedness across the force. You've prepared them for the high-end fight. Because of your rigorous, tireless commitment, the Navy is in a better place today because of you. You've pushed the community to new heights. You've cared for them every step of the way. So that's a lot of words. I am the simplest man in this grouping today. So let me give you what I learned about the Air Boss in 40 years. I'll give it to you in long terminology because this is what it boils down to me. When I hear Admiral DeWolf Miller his name, Bullet, here's what I think of. A proven lethal combat pilot. Commander of a USS aircraft carrier as a captain and as a strike group commander. Husband, father, family man. Mentor, leader, and friend. Bullet, I can't express enough how grateful I am to you for all your work over 40 years. If the Miller family were ready to give him back to you, just so you know, you have the hardest job. To pry him out of this Navy life will not be easy. Ellen, I'm sorry. Good luck with that. For the Weitzels, congratulations and welcome aboard. And for everybody who participated today in this COVID times, thanks for coming and spending this time. It means a lot to Ellen, to Kenny, to Melody, to Bullet, to Laura and me. Thanks again for allowing me to participate. Bullet, will you join me at the center stage, please? The President of the United States takes pleasure in presenting the Distinguished Service Medal to Vice Admiral DeWolf H. Miller III United States Navy for service as set forth in the following citation. For exceptionally meritorious service to the United States in duties of great responsibility as both Commander Naval Air Forces and Commander Naval Air Force U.S. Pacific Fleet from January 2018 to October 2020. Vice Admiral Miller displayed extraordinary vision, insight, and innovation throughout his leadership of the Navy's operational aviation enterprise encompassing 100,000 personnel, effectively manning, training, and equipping 11 aircraft carriers and nine carrier air wings. He provided combat-ready forces to combatant commanders worldwide, including 33 deployments of carrier air wings and expeditionary squadrons. His prudent execution of a $5.4 billion annual enterprise-wide budget and championing of innovative concepts were the driving force behind the Navy's achievement of the Secretary of Defense's mandated 80% readiness rates, which yielding over 340 mission-capable Super Hornets and 93 mission-capable Growlers, a level of readiness not achieved in more than a decade. As the warfare community leader, he personally influenced the first of its kind naval aviation leader development strategy, emphasizing character and competence. 
Vice Admiral Miller's superior performance of duties culminated his 39 years of honorable and dedicated military service. By his superior leadership, wise judgment, and deep devotion to duty, Vice Admiral Miller reflected great credit upon himself and upheld the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. For the President, Kenneth Braithwaite, Secretary of the Navy. <laughs> Guests, please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, Vice Admiral Miller, Commander, Naval Air Force, U.S. Pacific Fleet. I was just telling Admiral Aquilino that uh, because this is a family event, it wouldn't have been the same without him being here. Um, that's a lot of history uh, together, and uh, we're honored, like I said, for uh, having him here, and I appreciate this award. Uh, a lot of great people. So uh, let's get it started off. So that is the booming voice of the ship's air boss. It's what you hear, what you just heard, is what you hear when you man up your aircraft and prepare to fly off the deck of one of our aircraft carriers. The first time I heard that announcement, I was manning up for my very first mission on board CV-41. <laughs> that ship you see behind me. I was a young lieutenant. Helen and I were living in Japan with one-year-old twins. The midway flight deck was quite a bit smaller than this magnificent ship. She was conventionally powered. The air wing was comprised of A-7 Corsairs, F-4 Phantoms, A-3 Whales, A-6 Intruders, and H-3 Sea Kings. Not one of those airplanes fly in our Navy today. A visual example of how rapidly the air wing evolves to maintain supremacy in the air and on the sea. And that ship, as you can see, my first ship is now a museum. Oh, you good? Good. But back then, I finished my pre-flight inspection. I get ready to climb into the ladder, into the cockpit of the vintage Vietnam War vintage A7E. The plane captain is a young 19-year-old sailor. He tells me that the aircraft is ready to go. He left a can of whoop-ass behind the seat for me. You see, he's excited and proud of what he does. I know his last name and his favorite sports team, but that's about it. Regardless, I trust him. I trust him with my life, and it is in his hands. He represents the squadron maintainers and support personnel who, without fanfare, climb all over an aircraft under the most extreme conditions to ensure it's ready and safe so our Navy can accomplish its mission from the sea. Their work is never done, but it is always well done. They enable our intrepid aviators to flight, win, and fight and win again and again. So thank you to all the squadron sailors who got me ready, strapped me in. All right, all strapped in, engine started, avionics all set up. I know the checklist by heart. Habit patterns developed by doing things the same way every time, just like Shortney taught me. Time now to thank all of my mentors, squadron XOs, COs, CAGs, carrier COs, strike group commanders, and graybeards. I thank you. Okay, the yellow shirt signals, they're breaking me down, removing all chocks and chains, mask, oxygen, come on. Release the parking brake, add some power, follow the yellow shirt's commands to taxi to the catapult. Spread and lock the wings. Launch bar comes down. Taxi about a little bit more into the shuttle. Almost there. On signal, power comes all the way up. Shuttle pulls into tension and the plane squats. 
You just feel the power under you as you wipe out the controls. Don't forget the rudders. One last check of the instrument. Crisp salute. Right hand behind the control stick on the A7, up on the towel rack for the F-18. Head back on the headrest. And you wait one, two seconds. There it is. The expected three bounces at the start of the catapult stroke. You get slammed back into the seat, and it feels right. And you know you got a good shot. You strain to keep focused on the airspeed. It's displayed on the HUD. And two seconds later, you're flying. You're at 150 knots. Clearing turn, gear flaps. Get to 100 feet. Once again, you are just reminded about how much you love this business. Truly, truly love this business. So what do you do? You let out a yell to yourself because it's just so cool. All right, now compartmentalize. Clear the mechanism. Focus. You got a mission to accomplish. But first, thank you to all the ship's company sailors who work tirelessly throughout our carriers to support the mission to the flight deck personnel who maintain and operate the catapults and arresting gear, to the crash and salvage teams who wear a complete firefighting ensemble even in the scorching dry heat of the Arabian Gulf, to the engineers and combat systems operators who ensure our systems and equipment are ready always, to the sailors who man the nuclear reactors, you taught me so much and you have earned my profound respect, to the many who work in supply in the galleys 24-7, to the corpsmen, deck seamen, intelligence specialists, aviation, ordna aviation ordnance men, quartermasters and yeomen, professional sailors all, I thank you. The mission I'm on has now evolved uh, over time. It started with intercepting and flying on the wings of Soviet Badger, Bear, and Backfire bombers, as well as IL-38 May maritime patrol aircraft. We conducted long-range war at sea practice strikes that had us flying directly over Soviet ships in the early to mid-80s. We knew the enemy then. We evolved into Ernest Well missions protecting reflagged Kuwaiti tankers transiting the Straits of Hormuz in the late 80s. That was the first of many deployments in and around the Iraqi desert. Desert Shield provide comfort. Operations Northern and Southern Watch. In the 90s, we had a change of scenery as we flew over Bosnia during Operation Deny Flight, then back to the desert, combating terrorism and an elusive enemy. Today, we find ourselves once again in a great power competition. Comes full circle. I will never forget low-level flights in the Philippines, flying below canyon walls of Star Wars Canyon in Oman, both day and at night, skirting the majestic hills of Slovenia, circling Mount Vesuvius while wearing night vision goggles amazed at the heat that still emanates from that Italian volcano. I led a division of F-18s right past the Great Sphinx of Giza in Egypt. I've seen the darkest of nights, the starriest of nights, glorious sunrises and sunsets from 30,000 feet. I've surfed clouds, just me and my F-18, with pure joy. And like the poem High Flight by John Gillespie McGee Jr. states, Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun split clouds. And it concludes with, And while with silent lifting mind I've trod, the high untrespassed sanctity of space put out my hand and touched the face of God. Time to get serious again. The first rule of carrier flying is, Got to look good around the ship. Overhead, 2,000 feet, breaking the deck for the final time. I've timed when the last aircraft's going to shoot off the waist, push from 2,000 feet, shooting for 400. No, let's make this last one look really good. 550 knots for the break. A crisp break at the round down. There's six G's. Ooh, that feels good. Ease the pull, get a little bit of lateral separation, then pull hard again to bleed that airspeed. 250 knots, gear, flaps, lock the harness. There's the round down. Start the turn, double check, one, two, three, down and locked. 
Got a ball, I see a cut light from paddles signifying my final clear to land. Pull little power as the wings get under me. And then it's meatball lineup, angle of attack. One more time, meatball lineup, angle of attack. Crest the ball, deck surprises me, which is a good thing. I instinctively go to full power as I feel the tug of the two wire. A good time to thank the landing signal officers. Thank you for all the late nights and weekends you spend on the end of the runways ensuring we're safe to go to the boat. Thank you for the bad weather days and nights on the platform ensuring us mortals safely clear the ramp and return to the ready rooms below. You've saved my life a number of times. Your calm voice on a dark rainy night lowers the heart rate a few beats and lets us all know that we'll be okay. To past, present, and future paddles, I thank you. So I look up and I see the flight deck yellow chief shirt giving me a hookup signal. So I raise the hook, unlock the wings, start taxiing and clear the landing area. I find the squadron chief at two o'clock, give him a thumbs up signifying that the aircraft is up and ready to go once again, once it gets refueled and rearmed. To the chief petty officers, thank you. I've learned valuable lessons from the chief petty officers every day I've spent in the Navy. Later in life as a flag officer, I've been blessed with amazing front offices, command master chiefs, force master chiefs, aides, a writer, executive assistants, chiefs of staff and protocol teammates, as well as phenomenal assistant chiefs of staffs and end codes. It does take an army, I mean a Navy. I realize that and I'm grateful for each and every one of you and Ellen joins me in thanking you. Kenny and Melody, you're inheriting an amazing team at the headquarters. And as Admiral Aquilino said, you are the perfect couple to leave na lead naval aviation into the future. You will love Coronado and San Diego. Absolutely the most military friendly duty station we've ever experienced. Take time to establish relationships with that community. We were, and we're very thankful that we did. Kenny, you're gonna be joined by the three best wingmen you could ever have leading the Naval Aviation Enterprise, and Vice Admiral Dean Peters at Nav Air, Lieutenant General Mark Wise, the Marine Corps Deputy Commandant for Aviation, as well as Rear Admiral Scott Jones leading the reserves. I thank them, and Ellen and I wish both of you all the best. It's now time to park the jet, bring this flight to a close so the team can get the jet ready for the next generation of warriors. I slowly make my way down the ladder. I'm a little older now, as that was a 40-year flight I just took you on. Met once again by my plane captain. She asked me how the flight was. I smile because I quickly flash back to being an eight-year-old boy watching the Blue Angels at the Naval Academy with my brother Mike and my parents, Kitty and Hugh. There aren't enough thanks to go around when talking about family, especially your parents. My mom's one tough cookie. I learned er early about uncompromising resolve and moral courage from her, and all about loyalty from my father. Suffice it to say, they were and continue to be always there with loving support. I thank you, for it was on that day in Annapolis that I had a dream, set a goal, and knew what I wanted to do with my life. I snap back and tell my plane captain, hey, thanks for asking. The flight was perfect. I wouldn't change a thing, and I thank you for your service. As I leave the flight deck in this final flight, I return home to a loving family. You see, I married my sweetheart, and we had three wonderful children together, all grown up and pretty perfect in my eyes. Military kids have it tough, but they learn to adapt to change better than most. Ryan, Sarah, and Emily, you are resilient, strong, fearless, and bold. Your mother and I are so proud to support you and cheer you on as you achieve your own dreams. I thank and I love you. Ellen's always made our house a home, always supported my career aspirations, kept me grounded, reminded me to be nice before I headed to work in the mornings, and is the most angelic and giving person that I know. A mom, a registered nurse, volunteer, organizer, friend, and leader. I think it's pretty common knowledge for everybody that I would not be here today if not for you. I admire you, I look up to you, I love you, and I thank you. A final thanks to our large and extended Miller-Russo family, the 76 chicks 
Van Gutten's Foxes and Gurneys for your loving and dedicated support over these 43 years. I'll end by stringing together two quotes that capture my thoughts at this very moment. The first from Admiral Arlie Burke's retirement speech in 1961, and the second from Hall of Fame baseball player Lou Gehrig. My service life has been rich and rewarding. No person can ask for more. And today, I do consider myself the luckiest man on the face of this earth. How blessed am I that I had the opportunity to live out my dream. I wish you all lives filled with unlimited ceilings and visibility. Cavu. God bless America, our Navy, Naval Aviation, and God bless you. I will now read my orders. Yes, please remain seated. CNO Order 1981. So Admiral Frank Caldwell, you are now the last member of the Naval Academy class of 1981 remaining on active duty. CNO Order 1981. Your request to be transferred to the retired list has been approved by the Secretary of Defense. Detach in October 2020 from duty as Commander Naval Air Forces, Commander Naval Air Force U.S. Pacific Fleet. Relieved of all active duty, effective 2359, 30 November. Vice Admiral Weitzel, I am ready to be relieved. I will now read my orders from CNO or Buper's order 4171. When, re when ordered, report as required to Chief of Naval Air Forces as his relief. I am ready to relieve you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, Commander, Naval Air Force, U.S. Pacific Fleet, Vice Admiral Kenneth R. Weitzel. Thanks, Pepper. Okay, after that rendition of uh, a flight evolution on the flight deck, the only thing missing is a, uh, is a slider or a Barney Clark uh, down below so that we can finish it off and go to bed about 2 o'clock in the morning. If anybody didn't notice... Uh, uh, as the Navy flag was uh, mirac mir uh, miraculously moving in the breeze today, and it fell over, there were three men up here on the podium that jumped about a half an inch, uh, telling you that the flight deck is a dangerous place and that uh, we were scared to death as soon as that thing happened, especially Admiral Miller with, the, uh, with it happening right behind him. This is, a, uh, this is a great day. I appreciate all the, uh, the friends that have showed up on the flight deck as well as the uh, virtual friends. It's about 75 bucks for a hot sauna session here in Coronado. You're getting it free. And for those out in virtual land, uh, head to the refrigerator and get another beverage. Uh, uh, I promise we'll be done uh, relatively soon. As Bullet said, uh, TR is a great uh, venue uh, to hold the change of command. Uh, force generation uh, is what this carrier and what our Navy does, and these guys are preparing to go out yet again on a back-to-back -back deployment, leaving again this winter to go forward and showing what an aircraft carrier and a carrier strike group can do forward deployed for us. So I'm very proud uh, to be on TR today. Admiral Aquilino, Laura, Jess, uh, Lisa, and Jessica in absentia. Hey, thanks for, uh, uh, thanks for being here today. It's been a great honor uh, and a lot of fun to call you guys friends over, uh, over the many years we've been together. Uh, as, uh, as Admiral Aquilino said, we've all grown up together and our kids have grown up together. Countless deployments, countless detachments. Uh, there's been a few countless uh, daredevil cartwheeling uh, tubing events at Smith Mountain Lake. And more than once, there was a, you kids will learn how to fly one way or the other, uh, echoing off the cove walls of uh, Bernard's Landing. Uh, I still can't believe the kids haven't been injured from those events. Hey, boss, thanks for the trust and confidence uh, uh, for having let me assume uh, 
uh, Air Forces and the Air Boss. Thanks to uh, Ellen and Bullet for the action-packed turnover. It would have been easy for you to have dropped the mic, run a ticker tape parade lap, uh, and ride off into the sunset, but you guys selflessly pumped the brakes and brought Melody and I on board. We're both a bit intimidated to merge behind your successes, but the map you've given us is well marked and very much appreciated. Thanks for the flyover. Always fitting to have a change of command on an aircraft carrier with a flyover of fourth and fifth generation aircraft. Cos Pepper McCoy, thanks for coordinating it uh, and running the staff so well and sending Bullet and Ellen off in fine fashion. I want to thank the Air Force's uh, Assistant Chiefs of Staffs for rapidly bringing me up to speed and the front office for putting the pieces of the puzzle together. I promise to run faster. My love and thanks go to Hannah and Jeb. I'm not going to squirt. I'm so proud of how you both have grown and continue to serve as examples of military kids. As Bullet said, despite the separations and a nomadic lifestyle, seem to always land solidly on your feet. Thank goodness you had your mother as an anchor for our family. Absence makes the heart grow fonder, but it can't make up for the, lo the lost moments. Luckily, we've super supersized the time we did share together and made great memories along the way. Melly, I love you more than anything, and the times I go away are harder more now than ever. Thanks for another household good move. I promise the next truck could be the last. San Diego, not a bad place to land, even if it's the first time here. Yep, we'll head back to Hawaii after COVID's over with uh, to see what it's like. And thanks to our families in virtual land, my parents and Mel's parents, June and JD, Ruth and Bob, you continue to provide the foundation of our strength as we've moved across the country and around the world. Know that we love you more than ever and are excited that although unable to be here today, you can participate virtually. We look forward to having you visit San Diego as soon as possible. And as Mel's mom likes to say, she'll only visit twice a year for six months at a time. Thank you to our extended family back in Virginia and beyond. The words of encouragement and the grounding you provide continue to give us more, uh, provide more value than you likely realize. We are blessed to have you all. I'd also like to thank my friends uh, that are joining us, my college buds who dialed in. Now this group is unusual because they dialed in more in amazement than to watch this time-honored uh, time change of command. The ODU team in Tidewater, thanks for the calls and the messages over the last couple of weeks. I truly hope we can get together again soonest. To the friends and mentors who have played a major role in my professional development, you know who you are, and I can never thank you enough for your attention and your patience. I vow to do my very best to pay your investment in me forward by leading naval aviation with drive, character, and moral compass that you represented it and demonstrated over years of friendship and association. It's an honor to become the ninth Air Boss. The list of those who have served under the title of Air Boss and their predecessors, Commander Naval Air Forces Pacific Fleet, remain the titans of naval aviation. My eight Air Boss predecessors, Nathman, Malone, Zortman, Kilkline, Myers, Buss, Shoemaker, Miller, offer incredible large shoes to fill. Walking past the pictures, the pictures each day since I arrived at Air Forces, I feel their eyes following me like a scene from Harry Potter at Hogwarts. That scrutiny alone on top of today's opportunities to excel is enough to keep the sweat pumps running at full RPM. I'm humbled and honored to join the Air Boss roster. Admiral Nimitz commented on the leadership opportunity he was given in 1941. It's a great responsibility, but I shall do my utmost to meet it. Historical times aside, the challenges of today's strategic environment offer comparisons that should influence us to have a bias for action, force generation, and the capability and capacity to employ the force, fight tonight and win, drive every man, train, and equip process at Naval Air Forces. I look back and found a copy of Volume 1, Issue 1 of the Naval Aviation Readiness Integrated Improvement Program, NAVRIP, published in the spring of 2003 under Vice Admirals Malone, Zortman, and Massenburg. 
Fundamental process changes were implemented to sustain aviation readiness through process improvement. But however, we deviated from that critical initiative. Bullet has gotten us back on glide slope and turned over a well-oiled machine. Under Bullet's leadership, the band is back together and Enterprise, in Naval Aviation Enterprise, is a mechanism with that bias to action. The fruits of that accomplishment have satisfied former SecDef Mattis's call for 80% mission-capable strike fighters, in fact implemented across all Super Hornets. That success is infectious and growing across all type model series. Bullet mentioned it, but the drum, drumbeat collaboration with the U.S. Marine Corps with Lieutenant General Mal Wise, Vice Admiral Peters, Admiral Shane Gahagan, Navy Supply, Admiral Pete Stamatopoulos, Fleet Readiness Centers, Admiral Trent DeMoss, and N-98, Hi-Fi Harris, and Naval Reserve with Joneser is the process for sustaining readiness, capability, capacity, in as cost-wise fashion as possible. These are the new titans of naval system sustainment. I think I've mentioned the word greatness a few times, and along that vein, I thought I'd offer that Winston Churchill said, the price of greatness is responsibility. With regards to naval aviation, the ultimate responsibility rests on the air boss's shoulders, and I look forward to accelerating and improving upon the incredible initiatives that Vice Admiral Miller has begun. I can't uh, uh, stop mentioning folks except for, without mentioning my partner in responsibility, Admiral Oscar Meyer at Naval Air Forces Atlantic. And I look forward to working with and melding the efforts of our staffs under the one Naval Air Force banner. A few tenets that I'll expand on in months to come. The primacy of warfighting will not be compromised. Great power competition environment requires a constant press for advantage in mastery of our domain, superiority in aerial combat execution, and coordination across multiple domains. Our people remain the competitive advantage versus the adversary. Training to high-end warfare, expanding experience-based assignments, and repairing pilot production shortfalls are today items to be addressed. The Carrier Strike Group remains the centerpiece of the Navy's four deployed forces, employed in a distributed manner. Mobility, lethality, flexibility, and deterrence combine to create an insatiable worldwide demand. That flexibility was recently demonstrated under Exercise Valiant Shield, and then combining USS America's Expeditionary Strike Force together to make a combined strike force. Next, we'll develop the air wing of the future, focused on that lethality as they man our carriers. And then finally, a relentless search for efficiency. This is not a boilerplate statement. We're in control of our own destiny, but it will come, it'll come from our own introspection, accelerating the goods, discarding the others, and modifying the processes that show potential. A sense of urgency must be inculcated into our force generation and, pr and process culture. NAE has led the past two years, maturing perform to plan and naval sustainment. Not resting on those breakthroughs will focus on a log another logical branch in achieving cost reductions while generating forces. Make no mistake, this isn't doing more with less. This is a clear-eyed, blank sheet of paper driven by questioning attitude and data. Finally, I want to pay it forward and thank the myriad organizations that make up the NAE. Thank them for what they've already accomplished. Thank them for thinking, acting, and operating differently. Thanking them for being comfortable with uncomfortable. And thank them for moving forward toward the challenge what lies ahead. I'm humbled to be Air Boss number nine. Speed angels on the left, speed angels on the right, fights on. God bless our nation, our Navy, and naval aviation. Thank you. Bosun's mate, post the flag detail. The flag being used in today's ceremony was flown over the United States Naval Academy, where Vice Admiral Miller began his naval service in 1977. It was flown over USS Midway, then Lieutenant Miller's first carrier, and also USS George H. W. Bush his last carrier, the ship where he served as both the commanding officer 
and the Strike Group Commander. It was also flown in a Blue Angels F-18 Super Hornet and finally over the AirPAC headquarters, his last duty station. I am the flag of the United States of America and my name is Old Glory. I fly atop the world's tallest buildings. I stand watch in America's halls of justice. I fly majestically over institutions of learning. I stand guard with the greatest military power in the world. Look up and see me. I stand for peace, truth, honor, and justice. I stand for freedom. I am confident, I am arrogant, I am proud. When I am flown with my fellow banners, my head is a little higher, my colors a little truer. I bow to no one. I am recognized all over the world. I am worshiped, saluted, respected, revered. I am loved and I am feared. I have fought in every battle of every war for more than 200 years. Gettysburg, Shiloh, San Juan Hill, the trenches of France, the Argonne Forest, Anzio, Rome, the beaches of Normandy, the jungles of Guam, Okinawa, Tarawa, Korea, Vietnam, the Persian Gulf, Afghanistan, and a score of other places long forgotten by all, except by those who were there with me. I, I was there. I lead my sailors and Marines. I followed them. I watched over them. They love me. I was on a small hill in Iwo Jima. I was battle torn and tired, but my sailors and Marines cheered me. I was proud. I was at ground zero in New York City on September 11th as cowardly fanatics attacked America. I was raised from the ashes of once proud buildings by brave firefighters, heroes who risked their lives to save others, showing all that America, although bloody, would never be beat. Those who would destroy me cannot win, for I am the symbol of freedom, of one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I have been soiled, burned, torn and trampled on in the streets of my own country. And when it is done by those with whom I have served in battle, it hurts. But I shall overcome, for I am strong. I have slipped the bonds of earth, and from my vantage point on the moon, I stand watch over the unchartered new frontiers of space. I have been a silent witness of all of America's finest hours. But my finest hour comes when I am torn into strips and used as bandages for my wounded comrades on the field of battle. When I fly half-mast to honor my soldiers, my sailors, my airmen, and my Marines, and when I lay in the trembling arms of a grieving mother at the grave of her fallen son or daughter, I am proud. My name is Old Glory. Long may I wave, dear God, long may I wave. Vice Admiral Miller has presented his flag to his wife, Ellen. Flag detail, dismissed. Additionally, Ellen has been awarded the Distinguished Public Service Award for her dedicated service. It reads, for distinguished public service in support of service members and their families of Commander Naval Air Forces and Commander Naval Air Force U.S. Pacific Fleet from January 2018 to October 2020. Mrs. Miller improved the lives of families of Naval Aviation Enterprise by building a positive command climate supporting countless community outreach and scholarship events and advancing spouse programs 
across naval air stations and aircraft carriers worldwide. Additionally, she served as a peerless representative of the Department of Defense, Department of the Navy, and Naval Air Forces during official visits with foreign and national defense leaders and dignitaries, specifically with the United Kingdom as they introduced the Queen Elizabeth class aircraft carriers and P-8 aircraft, as well as with the Royal Australian Navy and Air Force as they integrated naval aircraft into their forces. Her lifetime of service as a spouse, military and civilian volunteer, demonstrated selfless leadership and raised awareness of family issues, reinforcing support of Navy dependents and serving as an inspirational example of continued service to the United States Navy and the nation. Mrs. Miller's dedicated support and commitment to Navy families and total devotion to duty reflected great credit upon her and were in keeping with the highest traditions of the Department of the Navy, signed Kenneth Braithwaite, Secretary of the Navy. Boston's mate, post the side boys. Vice Admiral Miller will now render his final salute and request permission to go ashore from Admiral Aquilino. Navy family, retired, departing. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our ceremony. We are Naval Aviation.